Hey, welcome everybody to a new global immunotalk. I'll be brief. I just want to remind you, I'm Carl Rothlin. I'm here with my co-organizer, Dr. Elina Zoniga. And we have organized this hopefully with the goal of benefiting and inspiring immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and making these talks accessible to everybody without the need of traveling. As you know, we have an extraordinary lineup of speakers. We'll have today Boris Races, who is going to be now very soon introduced by Elena. And next week we'll have Julie Magarian Blander. So we look forward to seeing you next week as well. And with this, I will let uh, my friend and organizer Elena introduce our global immuno speaker today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carly. It is my Great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Boris Reisis. Uh, so Boris is a native of Moscow, Russia, where he initiated his education in medicine. Uh, he then completed his PhD with Oren Cohen at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, and his postdoctoral training with the late Philip Leather at Harvard Medical School. After serving on the faculty of Columbia University Medical School, Boris joined New York University Grossman School of Medicine in 2015 as a professor of pathology and medicine. He served as a di director of immunology training program until earlier this year and is now director of the Translational Immunology Center at NYU, as well as co-director of the Colton Center for Autoimmunity. Boris is a standing member of Cellular and Molecular Immunology B NIH study section, and uh, it's important to know that his laboratory work has been recognized with many, many awards, uh, including the William Paul Distinguished Innovator Award from the Lupus Research Alliance and the Frederick Alt Award for New Discoveries in Immunology for the Cancer Research Institute. So I would like to emphasize and disclose that I am a great fan of Boris uh, science, uh, not only because we share our interest on plasmocytoids and dendritic cells, but because his lab has made truly impactful contributions to our understanding of the molecular control of normal and malignant hematopoiesis, immune system development and immune system function. And this includes, and although it's not limited to, the discovery of transcription factors and signaling pathways that regulate the development and function of different dendritic cell subsets, including the classical antigen-presenting dendritic cells and the interferon-producing plasmocytoid dendritic cells. And so among all these discoveries, I would like to highlight Boris' identification of the master regulation of uh, PDC development, TCF4, which encodes for E2-2, uh, and which uh, this discovery was extremely welcome in the dendritic cell field because it allowed establishing the identity of plasmocytoid dendritic cells as an independent developmental lineage and also shed light on how their development and their maintenance is regulated. And uh, this finding also allowed Boris to later provide a further important insight into the role of plasmocytoid dendritic cells in different types of infections in immune homeostasis and autoimmunity. So in addition to the, his contributions to the dendritic cell field, Boris has also contributed to the understanding of blood development and hematopoiesis, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, particularly the function of endogenous hematopoietic stem cells in normal and pathological hematopoiesis. And last but not least, I would also like to mention that Boris' team has uh, made important discoveries on the mechanisms of systemic autoimmunity, particularly in responses to self-DNAs and uh, responses and lupus, 
uh, which I think we will learn more about during his talk today. So on a personal note, I mentioned I'm fan of uh, Boris Science, but I would also like to mention that I'm fan of his style as a scientist. Uh, from my interactions with Boris, and I know him some, I, I, know, I don't know him a lot, but from my interactions with him, I see him not only as a brilliant mind, but also a very humble and easy to approach human being who is always willing to help. And so I really admire uh, that from your personality, Boris. And uh, so we could not be happier and more honored uh, to have you here as a global immune speaker. And we really appreciate the efforts that you have uh, made to make this happen. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Elena, uh, and, uh, for very kind introduction. And thank both of you for doing this, for really expanding the audience uh, for, for this immunology uh, talks to, to the entire world, uh, essentially. And I, in particular, I'd like to mention that as, as the world moved to online conferences, I realized that at most conferences, the talks are pre-recorded, which of course is a, is a safer way of doing it, but it's kind of uh, on the boring side and takes out some of the fun. So I, I, I appreciate in particular that you guys have the guts to do it live because I think it's just uh, more fun and more authentic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. We can only do it because the, of the braveness of the speakers that uh, generously uh, help and, and agree to share their knowledge. So, as always, we would like to ask you a question uh, to let uh, know more about you and to know about uh, your experience, learn from your experience. And so the question for you today is, as an immigrant scientist, what would be your advice for students and or postdocs that are training abroad? Well, uh, it, it's very simple. I, I think uh, I would encourage everybody to view it as a bonus of our occupation and to take full advantage of it. Science is global and international as exemplified by, by, by this venue. And so we, we have the luxury to be exposed to different countries and cultures and to interact with people from all different ends of the world and, and cultures and ways of life. And I think it's a, it, it just uh, a great uh, source of knowledge about the world that I would encourage everybody to, to, to appreciate and take advantage of. I love it. Yeah, embrace the opportunity. Uh, yeah, borders are overrated in, in science, man. <laughs> Borderless science. Anyway, so Boris, we cannot wait to your talk. So uh, if you could share your screen. Sure. Let's see. Perfect. We see. Working. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, uh, uh, Elena, for a very kind introduction. So I'll uh, <clears throat> try to present today some of the work that we've been doing in the lab in the last few years that focuses on autoimmunity, uh, more specifically on this uh, uh, topic of autoimmunity to DNA. Uh, and just to remind everybody, especially the students, that we are really standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so I, I definitely encourage everybody, especially the trainees, to, 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 to read these uh, works from Paul Ehrlich from uh, early 20th century, where he tried to hypothesize how the immune system is working before much was known about it. And he was back then already impressed and, and scared by the fact that it, the immune system is very efficient. So it looks too easy to make an immune response, especially to, 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 to your own elements. So he essentially postulated that the organism possesses certain mechanisms that he called contrivances, by means of which the immunity reaction is prevented from acting against the organism's own elements and giving rise to autotoxins. 
and he further postulated that these contrivances are of the highest importance for the existence of the individual. So, so to translate uh, this amazing insight into our language, he basically postulated the existence of immune tolerance uh, and specific mechanisms that prevent autoantibodies from forming. So this is an amazing insight that, that I think uh, we are just uh, starting to fully appreciate and, and, and dissect uh, at the mechanistic level. Uh, and probably the next major insight uh, in this direction what was made by another giant uh, uh, in the field, uh, Henry Kunkel, who, who was working at Rockefeller University in the 60s and, and 70s, and he focused on an autoimmune disease, systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. Uh, it, it's uh, unfortunately uh, quite common and, and autoimmune disease that can be very severe. And, and, and the fundamental insight from Kunkel and his colleagues was that uh, the basic mechanism is the formation of autoantibodies to nuclear antigens, as demonstrated here back in 1966. And so these antibodies then. Uh, 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 bind these self antigens, form immune complexes that get deposited in tissues and cause inflammation. Uh, the, the most dangerous uh, inflammation in lupus is, is nephritis, which a lot of times leads to, term, uh, to, to end stage kidney disease and need for transplantation. Uh, along the way, he made another amazing discovery, namely that not all but some of the patients uh, were making autoantibodies to double-stranded DNA. Uh, and, and that discovery has been confirmed in, in dozens of studies uh, uh, ever since. And, and, and in this particular study from uh, five decades later, uh, it, it's shown that more than half of lupus patients have a high titer IgG to double-stranded DNA. Uh, uh, this number is actually higher in New York City, which has very ethnically diverse population more than 70% of patients at NYU have anti-DNA antibodies. This is a, a distinctive feature of lupus. It, it's not common in other autoimmune diseases. And most strikingly, uh, the titers of antibodies to DNA uh, tend to um, uh, track with flares of the disease, and, and, as shown here by the correlation of uh, anti-DNA titers and, and so-called SLEDI, a clinical score of, uh, of the disease. Uh, so, so these are uh, prevalent, uh, they are pathogenic, and, and while at it, I should mention that we still don't know how to treat this disease and, and anti-DNA responses in particular. This uh, lupus is still treated with heavy and non-specific immunosuppression, such as steroids, chemotherapy, and we really need to, uh, to do better in terms of more specific treatments there. But uh, apart from the unmet clinical need, uh, uh, anti-DNA reactivity, I think, poses very important conceptual questions for uh, immunology. And so if we try to be very simplistic and, and, and imagine what must be happening there, uh, we, we, we need to imagine that, well, some form of DNA uh, activates uh, autoreactive B cells that can recognize this DNA. Uh, these, these B cells become uh, plasma cells, uh, produce anti-DNA antibodies, which then bind, uh, again, some form of DNA, form immune complexes that get deposited in tissues and, and, and uh, cause inflammation and, and, and drive the disease. So uh, amazingly enough, uh, we, we still are missing some critical information uh, about this, uh, the, the, this uh, scheme. Starting from the fact of what's the actual antigen, what, what, what is the physical nature and form of DNA that becomes a self-antigen and drives this uh, uh, autoimmune response? Perhaps even more importantly, uh, a fundamental question is what prevents this from happening all the time in everybody? Because obviously self-DNA uh, self is, is readily available in the body, billions of cells turn over uh, every day, uh, there is about 5 nanogram per ml uh, uh, cell-free DNA in, in plasma of healthy people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, up to several percent of normal B-cell repertoire is potentially DNA reactive. This was shown by many methods and many labs. So there, there have to be some very specific mechanisms that 
basically make this DNA invisible to the normal immune system and prevent uh, uh, anti-DNA response from happening. And then the final important question is, is once these mechanisms fail and tolerance is broken, what, 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 what are the mechanisms that lead to uh, the development of uh, severe autoreactivity and autoimmunity because that's what we want to treat uh, after the patient comes down with the disease. So uh, in my lab, we started thinking about this several years ago, and we decided to uh, follow the clues uh, uh, offered by human genetics. And, and, and at the time, about a decade ago, uh, an amazing uh, genetic study came out um, uh, that, that basically looked at very rare families in which lupus uh, was running as a Mendelian trait. Uh, and so it was very severe lupus with childhood onset, uh, prominent anti-DNA reactivity and, and, and early onset of nephritis. Uh, and and they, they identified several such families, cloned the gene. Uh, the gene is called DNAs 1L3. And since then, this observation has been reproduced in, in several other studies, uh, including this latest study uh, that, that identified a compound heterozygote. So a non-familial case of DNAs 1L3 deficiency that, that again produced early onset uh, lupus with anti-DNA uh, antibodies. So, so uh, in addition to these null mutations in DNAs 103, there is a coding polymorphism that uh, uh, creates a hypomorphic protein. And by genome-wide association studies, this polymorphism has been uh, linked to several autoimmune diseases, including arthritis, scleroderma, and lupus. So, so uh, human genetic evidence is ironclad and clearly suggests that DNAs 103 it is critical to maintain tolerance uh, to DNA and prevent anti-DNA reactivity and lupus. So uh, we became interested in, in, in this and, and decided to look further. So what is DNAs 103? As the name suggests, is, is DNAs 1 like 3. It's a homologue of DNAs 1 or pancreatic uh, uh, DNAs, a classical secreted DNAs, um, very well studied. Uh, used mainly to digest DNA in food. Uh, and so uh, if you look at, uh, at the homology of DNAs 1 to DNAs 103 is very high. All the key residues are conserved. The catalytic uh, domain is very well conserved. But DNAs 103 also has some uh, distinct molecular features. Uh, uh, this, by the way, is, is a homology model. Uh, we don't have a crystal structure yet. It's a very stubborn protein. But uh, in this, uh, even in this homology model that uh, uh, if you kind of turn it on the side, you will see that DNAs 103 has uh, uh, this unique C-terminal peptide of about 20 amino acids, very positively charged, is predicted to form a tight alpha helix. And we and others have shown that it's uh, uh, in part responsible for some of the distinct uh, biochemical features of DNAs 103, especially its substrate preferences. And so if you just uh, take uh, recombinant DNAs 1 or DNAs 1 or 3 and, and throw on, on pure genomic DNA or any DNA, uh, DNAs 1 is actually doing very well. It's, it's a much more efficient DNA than DNAs 1 or 3. But, but if uh, you take any substrate that is more complex, DNA in any complex with protein or membrane, uh, the, the situation... Uh, turns around and DNAs 103 becomes much more efficient. And in this extreme case, we, we just isolate uh, intact nuclei and throw DNAs at them. DNAs 1 is not very good at it. Uh, we know that that's the basis of DNAs 1 hypersensitivity assay. But DNAs 103 has no problem chopping uh, native chromatin in intact nuclei. As you can see, it very quickly generates this uh, nucleosomal uh, ladder, while DNAs 1 is not really good at it. Uh, so so it, it has this unique uh, ability to digest DNA in complexes with proteins, including chromatin. DNAs 103 also has a very clearly distinct expression pattern. So DNAs 1 is mostly prominent in, in glands, in the gastrointestinal tract, there is some in the kidney. 
but DNA is 103 is produced primarily by cells of the immune system, most prominently by dendritic cells, both conventional and plasmacytoid. Uh, there is also some in the liver. And we were able to confirm that uh, using a, a, no, a DNA 103 knockout mouse that is also a knock-in for, uh, for LAG-Z. And so if you just uh, stain for the knock-in, you see the most prominent expression in uh, conventional dendritic cells. There is a bit in, in plasma cytoid dendritic cell that's actually higher in human. And there isn't much anywhere else in, 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 in some subsets of macrophages uh, in, in, in the gut and the liver in particular. And so clearly very unique uh, biochemical properties, very distinct expression pattern. So we looked into DNA 103 deficient mice uh, and sure enough, they were actually recapitulating the, the key uh, phenotype, which is a loss of tolerance to DNA. So, so uh, anti-DNA uh, IgG uh, in DNA 103 knockout mice were developing very rapidly uh, within a few weeks, and then they just uh, grow uh, with, with uh, the titers grow with age. And then eventually, as the mice get older, they, get, uh, they develop lupus-like disease, that includes uh, uh, autoreactivity to, to nuclear antigens, the so-called ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, uh, splenomegaly, T-cell activation, other signs of immune activation, and eventually deposition of uh, IgG and complement in, in kidney glomeruli. And on some genetic backgrounds, they pro progress to full-blown glomerulonephritis. So this... Uh, uh, really shows that the function of DNA 103 is conserved uh, between the species. And again, to emphasize the, 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 the distinct nature of DNA 103 and its unique function in, in maintaining tolerance to DNA, uh, we compared this to uh, uh, the deletion of DNA 1, because there, there is some evidence in the literature that DNA 1 deletion also induces some form of autoimmunity. But uh, in, in our hands, we see absolutely nothing. In the absence of DNAs1, we see no anti-DNA reactivity, anti-nucleosomal reactivity, uh, no um, uh, anti-DNA by Ellis spot compared to DNAs103, no signs of inflammation uh, or any kind of disease. And, and furthermore, when, when we made double knockout mice deficient for DNAs1 and DNAs103, there is no additive effect of DNAs1 deletion. So again, the function of DNAs103 in maintaining tolerance to DNA appears very unique. And so, uh, based on uh, some of our initial hints and on our ongoing uh, work, we uh, developed a working model of what DNA 103 might, might be doing with, with some of the predictions so that we uh, could go ahead and try to, uh, to explore them. So, so we, um, ba based on, um, on, on, on the so, uh, secreted nature of DNA 103 and some other hints, we, we uh, posited that DNA 103 acts in a cell extrinsic manner uh, to maintain tolerance to DNA, uh, and that it does something essentially to make cell DNA uh, less immunogenic and hide it, as it were, from the immune system. So it must be doing to something to cell-free DNA to, to reduce its uh, immunogenicity or exposure to the immune system. And then finally, an important prediction for us is that uh, the function of DNA 103 uh, it, it is implicated uh, beyond these unique uh, genetic cases of DNA 103 deficiency, and perhaps uh, the, uh, the activity of DNA 103 might be impaired in more uh, common sporadic uh, cases of DNA 103 without the genetic mutation, mutation. So this was our working model for the last few years, and I'll just update you on uh, our progress in um, uh, uh, in, in exploring these uh, particular predictions. Uh, starting from the first point, uh, the, the fact that DNA is 103 acts in a cell extrinsic manner. And that would be actually quite unique and very distinct from other DNAs that are known to, to uh, regulate uh, uh, tolerance and prevent autoimmunity, such as DNA 2 or, or, or T-Rex uh, 1. Uh, their deletion is known to cause uh, 
very severe cytokine or interferon-driven inflammation, interferonopathy. Uh, and uh, this is because uh, 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 <clears throat> DNA builds up intracellularly, activates the C-gas sting pathway, so the, the deletion of, uh, of C-gas or sting actually rescues the phenotypes of, uh, of these DNAs no, uh, knockouts. But uh, actually early on, we, we, we observed that something different is happens with DNAs 103, because when we took DNAs 103 knockouts that developed this autoreactivity and knocked out sting, the, the key uh, adapter of the uh, intracellular pathway of DNA sensing, uh, there was absolutely no effect. Uh, when we, on the other hand, deleted my D88, a key adapter of uh, toll-like receptors that sense uh, extracellular uh, uh, nucleic acids, there was a complete rescue of, uh, uh, of the phenotype. So, so that suggested to us that uh, DNAs 103 acts uh, outside of the cells. Uh, to uh, prove it in a more formal way, uh, we made mice uh, uh, that were DNAs 103 deficient on RAG uh, knockout background, so they also lack lymphocytes. Uh, lymphocytes are not a major source of DNAs 103, so we could then transfer lymphocytes back into these mice and, 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 and check the development of the disease. So first we had to do controls and, and uh, transfer total uh, lymphocytes, total DNT cells into RAG deficient mice. Uh, that that uh, by itself does not induce autoreactivity, even if you transfer uh, lymphocytes from DNAs 103 knockout. When we transfer uh, DNAs 103 knockout lymphocytes into DNAs 103 knockout RAG deficient mouse, uh, there is prominent autoreactivity. These are antinuclear antibodies in, in, in several mice. So this is not surprising, we just remade the knockout. Uh, but, but the interesting part is that when you transfer wild-type lymphocytes into DNAs 103 deficient uh, lymphopenic mice, you get prominent autoreactivity. Uh, and this is quantified here by uh, looking at titers of anti-DNA antibody. Again, wild-type lymphocytes transferred into DNAs 103 uh, 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 knockout RAG deficient mice develop anti-DNA antibodies suggesting that uh, the function of DNAs 103 is truly cell extrinsic and even normal lymphocytes wait when they end up in DNAs 103 deficient surroundings, uh, th th they break down tolerance and, and start reacting to, to DNA. While at it, uh, uh, we used it as an assay to, to potentially test uh, uh, the, the, the function of, uh, of, of different uh, nucleic acid sensors. Uh, and uh, so when you transfer lymphocytes from MyD88 knockout or ANC93B1 knockout, uh, we, which is deficient in sensing of um, uh, uh, through toll-like receptors, uh, uh, autoantibodies don't develop. Again, suggesting the key importance of the myd 88 dependent, ANC93 dependent uh, uh, TLR sensing of extracellular uh, nucleic acids, and also suggesting that a big part of this activity happens within lymphocytes. So going on to the next item of our agenda, we try to understand what exactly DNAs 103 is doing to, to, to uh, DNA to make it uh, less immunogenic. And so as part of this um, uh, uh, project, we were fortunate uh, to, to, to uh, set up a great collaboration with the lab of Dennis Law, who, who is a true pioneer of the study of cell-free DNA. Uh, and uh, this year was awarded the Breakthrough Prize for, for, for his pioneering work on the topic. So uh, 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 Dennis Law's lab at the University of Hong Kong uh, is um, outstanding in the analysis of cell-free DNA, in particular in sequencing it and, and determining computation, determining the size of cell-free DNA. So uh, in collaboration with Dennis Law, uh, we sequenced um, cell-free DNA from the plasma of control or, or, or DNAs 103 deficient mice with, with uh, different additional genetic lesions. 
And just as a quick primer on cell-free DNA, so, so this is the, 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 the frequency of cell-free DNA fragments in the plasma of, uh, of mice uh, uh, across different sizes uh, on the log scale. And as you can see, the most prominent peak of cell-free DNA conveniently has a size of a mononucleosome, li likely reflecting the fact that this is not true free DNA, but, but uh, circulating mononucleosomal fragments. And the frequency of larger fragments, such as di- and trinucleosomal, is orders of magnitude lower in, in wild-type mice. But as you can see, in the absence, in the absence of DNAs1, it still looks like a wild-type. But in the absence of DNAs103, uh, you have a much higher frequency of this longer di- and trinucleosomal uh, fragments. And this is very uh, significant. Uh, there isn't much of an uh, uh, additive by, by double knockout of DNAs1 and DNAs103. And just as an additional note, we also looked at DNAs103 knockouts that are deficient in CD40 ligands. As I will mention later, these mice don't develop anti-DNA uh, anti antibodies, but they still show this uh, uh, increase in, D in, in the uh, a fraction of longer DNA fragments, suggesting that this is uh, a primary effect and not a consequence of anti-DNA reactivity. So this is, uh, in the mice, this by the way was a great collaboration between uh, Lee Serpas, a graduate student in my lab, and Rebecca Chan and, and her colleagues in Dennis Law's lab. Uh, more recently, we, we were fortunate to keep collaborating with Dennis and also um, collaborate with several clinical groups who um, managed to, to collect samples from uh, patients with genetic DNA 103 deficiency. And Dennis again sequenced cell-free DNA from these patients. Uh, and, and remarkably, it looked very similar to what we initially found in mice. Uh, uh, the, 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 there are several abnormalities with cell-free DNA uh, 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 of these patients, but, but prominently there is a, 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 a very clear increase in longer uh, polynucleosomal uh, DNA fragments in circulation of these DNAs 103 deficient uh, genetic patients. So, so DNAs 103 seems to uh, restrict the length of circulating cell-free DNA and in particular remove these longer polynucleosomal fragments. Why is that important? Well, uh, we believe it is important because these longer fragments are just better uh, uh, immunogens. Uh, there was some earlier literature on, on the effect of DNA size. Um, it's somewhat controversial. So we, we went back to these experiments and we used uh, mononucleosomes or polynucleosomes as, as more physiological substrates. And this is a, a competition um, assay uh, for the binding of uh, 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 anti-DNA antibodies to double-stranded DNA. And as you can see, mononucleosomal fragments are not very efficient uh, uh, as competitors in this assay, but polynucleosomal uh, uh, fragments are much more efficient, and this is very significant. These longer fragments also seem to be better innate stimuli because um, we looked at, uh, at their ability to induce uh, interferon production from plasma dendritic cells. So for this, uh, uh, the surface uh, complex these uh, uh, fragments with uh, antimicrobial peptide, LL37, and, and through on, on PDCs. And as you can see, polynucleosomal fragments are, are much better at eliciting uh, type 1 interferon response than, mon uh, than mononucleosomal fragments. So altogether, we think that one important thing, uh, a function of DNAs 103, it is removal of this longer polynucleosomal fragments, which seem to be uh, better antigens for uh, uh, anti-DNA antibodies and hence B cells, and better innate stimuli for the production of cytokines. So, so size is important, but we also wondered if there is um, uh, anything that DNAs 103 might be doing to the physical uh, structure of uh, uh, and form of cell-free DNA. And in that we were uh, uh, very intrigued by uh, uh, literature um, that, that basically over the years uh, showed uh, 
a remarkable phenomenon that as cells are, are dying by apoptosis, here it's shown in culture, uh, these apoptotic blebs that form actually incorporate genomic DNA as shown here. And when they pinch off and form so-called microvesicles or, mi or microparticles, uh, these micro microparticles carry uh, genomic DNA of apoptotic cells. And even more strikingly, uh, as shown by, by many people, but, but primarily by the lab of David Pisetsky at Duke, who really was um, an early proponent of the importance of these microparticles. Uh, his lab has shown that somehow uh, chromatin uh, of dying cells not only gets incorporated on these microparticles, but gets exposed on the surface. You, you can detect it with anti-chromatin antibodies. And so, of course, uh, uh, in, in this form, it, it's almost an ideal antigen. It's exposed on the surface uh, and, and should be visible to B cells and autoantibodies. So we wondered if uh, DNAs 103 might have any specific role in uh, digesting chromatin in these microparticles. And indeed, we could show biochemically that it's much better than DNAs 1 at digesting this chromatin. Uh, but we wanted to be sure that this microparticle formation is not an uh, in vitro phenomenon, but, but these microparticles uh, really exist and carry uh, DNA uh, in, uh, in reality. And that seems to be the case. This is just uh, normal mouse plasma uh, with microparticle fraction isolated and stained for DNA and membrane. And you can clearly see these multiple uh, microparticles carrying DNA. We also use genetic markers of membranes and chromatin to confirm it and, 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 and show the existence of chromatin carrying microparticles in normal plasma. And so when you look at, uh, at the DNA content uh, of, of these fractions, actually in the mouse, we find that the majority of uh, cell-free DNA is associated with this microparticle fraction of the plasma that can be spun down. And when you look in DNAs 103 deficient mice, there is a significant increase uh, in, in, the, uh, in DNA uh, in both uh, soluble fraction, but also importantly in the microparticle fraction uh, uh, of, of the plasma. And this is very different in the case of DNAs 1 knockout, which shows a very nice and significant increase in soluble uh, DNA, but absolutely nothing uh, in, in, in the microparticle fraction. So it seems that uh, this chromatin packaged in microparticles is a true physiological substrate of DNAs 103. So this is mice, what about humans? Uh, again, it's, it's even easier to find this uh, DNA carrying microparticles in normal human plasma. Uh, when we looked at DNA content, uh, in the human, it seems that the majority of, uh, of, of, of cell-free DNA is actually not in microparticles, probably about 25% of cell-free DNA is associated with microparticle fraction. Uh, but, but this ratio clearly seems reversed in, uh, in uh, these uh, uh, patients with genetic DNAs 103 deficiency that uh, we, we were lucky to obtain several samples uh, from our clinical collaborators. So they, uh, the, the, the fraction of cell-free DNA associated with microparticles seems to be higher uh, in the absence of DNAs 103. And so again, we believe that this uh, uh, increased uh, um, DNA load in microparticles has uh, biological consequences because this uh, uh, DNA and probably associated proteins become antigenic. So for example, DNAs 103 knockout mice quickly develop autoantibodies that stain microparticles and this staining can be disrupted by DNAs 103. So these are DNAs 103 sensitive antigens. The same is also true in humans. Uh, uh, many lupus patients uh, have antibodies that stain microparticles, and this staining is sensitive to digestion with DNA 103. I'll come to that uh, uh, a bit later, but, but this uh, reactivity to DNA 103 sensitive antigens on microparticles seems to be a common feature both in mouse models and in human disease. So, uh, uh, it seems that DNAs 103 really controls uh, both the, the length and the, the, the physical form of cell-free DNA. 
And so the final item is, um, well, uh, is it implicated in, in sporadic lupus? So we collaborated with uh, uh, Jill Bouillon and, and, and others in the Division of Chromatology at NYU. Uh, and, and we set up an essay, uh, uh, Hannes Hartle, a former medical fellow in the lab, set up an essay to, to measure the activity of DNAs 103 in, in patients' plasma. Uh, this is not a perfect essay. It's, it's based on the unique ability to di of DNAs 103 to digest intact nuclei. Uh, it's not a perfect essay, but, but good enough to, to see, for example, a clear difference uh, between control uh, plasma and, DN and, and plasma from DNAs 103 deficient patients. So we applied this essay to, to uh, plasma of um, human lupus patients. And what we saw that um, uh, uh, about half of patients with severe lupus, with, with lupus nephritis, renal involvement, showed a decreased DNAs 103 activity. Of course, not completely gone, but, but significantly decreased. And this decrease was much uh, uh, le less common, uh, almost absent in the patient with uh, uh, less severe lupus without renal involvement in these two different cohorts. So uh, there might be many reasons why, why DNAs 103 activity becomes um, impaired by non-genetic means. But we explored perhaps the most uh, obvious one, which would be the, the development of autoantibodies to DNA 103. And indeed, we could detect it by, by many um, uh, assays, including the straight ELISA. Uh, we, we showed that patient, about half of the patients with uh, severe uh, SLE showed autoantibodies to recombinant DNA 103. We could confirm it by bead ELISA and by Western. I'm not showing this. Uh, importantly, there was very nice inverse correlation between uh, these autoantibodies and activity of DNA 103. We could also directly confirm that these antibodies are inhibitory by throwing them into the digestion assay and showing that they inhibit the function of DNA 103. And again, this seems to be a quite specific kind of autoimmune attack on DNA 103 as opposed to the homologous. Uh, DNA is one because these are multiple patients' uh, samples that show anti DNA 103 reactivity. There is minimal anti DNA 1 reactivity, uh, and, and even when we did a competition assay, so DNA 103 competes for binding, but DNA 1 does not. So, again, a very specific uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, reactivity. So if, if that's the case, if DNA 103 is really impaired, there, there have to be consequences. And, and the most obvious one would be increased fraction of DNA in microparticles. And that seems to be the case. Again, if you look at total DNA levels, they don't seem to be different in DNA 103 deficient uh, patients or in patients with non-genetic re reduction of DNA 103. But if you look at uh, the fraction of DNA uh, that is associated with microparticles, it's very significantly increased in these groups. And again, a uh, very uh, strong inverse correlation with uh, uh, DNA's 103 activity. And then finally, uh, again, in terms of autoreactivity to, to antigens on microparticles, we found that uh, uh, more than half of uh, patients with lupus nephritis show this uh, binding to, to microparticles that is DNA 103 uh, sensitive. And, and this is much less frequent in, in non-severe lupus. Uh, and again, uh, the, the, this type of reactivity is uh, uh, prevalent uh, 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 with lower DNA 103 activity and, and, and there is a higher fraction of, uh, of DNA in microparticles uh, of these patients. So to try and summarize uh, all these data, what we think is happening is that uh, as the cells are turning over uh, in the body, many of them release uh, cell-free DNA, especially in the form of chromatin packaged uh, in these uh, microparticles. Some of this chromatin can get exposed on the surface of microparticles. And so the key function of DNA 103 uh, is to uh, reduce the, the DNA load of microparticles and to, in particular, to remove this longer uh, uh, polynucleosomal fragments from circulation, 
which we also uh, are not sure in this data, but they seem to be enriched in the microparticle fraction. So this seems important kind of to hide the cell-free DNA from the immune system and maintain tolerance. So that uh, in, uh, when DNA is 103 activity is reduced, either in these very rare genetic cases or more commonly uh, in, in sporadic lupus through the development of autoantibodies to DNA 103, uh, there, there is more of this cell-free DNA uh, exposed, uh, uh, stronger uh, immunogens in the form of polynucleosomal fragments emerge, and they become visible to the immune system and contribute to autoimmunity and inflammation. So this is, of course, our working model. A lot still needs to be done. Uh, but, but this is at least uh, uh, where, where we stand um, with respect to uh, the regulation of cell-free DNA as an antigen and the role of DNA 103 in the process. So for the remaining uh, few minutes of the talk, I would like to switch gears a bit uh, and, and, and talk about uh, uh, our uh, attempts to use DNA 103 deficient mice as a model to better understand the nature of uh, uh, anti-DNA responses. And so um, this uh, uh, DNA is one of three deficient mice uh, to, to us represent a very nice sort of reductionist model of anti-DNA response because uh, it's a uh, uh, th they show a very specific response to DNA uh, and nucleosomes, not to other self-antigens. And this response is also resolved in time. So, so this initial breakdown uh, of tolerance uh, uh, happens within the first few weeks. And then for many months, the, the mice just generate uh, anti uh, DNA autoantibodies. And then eventually uh, there is uh, autoreactivity to other antigens emerge and there, is, there are signs of immune activation and tissue damage. So this is very different uh, from other common models of lupus in which uh, reactivity to many antigens, lymphoproliferation, uh, uh, inflammation, all of this uh, happens at once and it's very hard to, to tell the causes from consequences. So we've been using this model to understand the key uh, mechanistic requirements for uh, anti-DNA response driven by, by this extracellular DNA. So uh, just to summarize some of our results here. So first, uh, we were so impressed uh, by, by, by the speed with which uh, this uh, anti-DNA response emerges that, that, that we started seriously doubting uh, the role of T-cells. So we, we wanted to be sure that the response that we see is T-cell dependent. Uh, to to uh, test that, we, we knocked out CD40 ligand, an, an essential component of T cell help for B cells. Uh, and, and that was a useful sanity check. Actually, uh, the, resi the resulting double knockouts still have uh, a, a reduced but quite substantial level of total IgG, but IgG to nucleosomes or double stranded DNA was completely wiped out. Uh, nothing remained, there was no anti-nuclear antibodies, no sign of immune activation such as phenomegaly or kidney pathology or T-cell activation, uh, nothing. So, so this response is strictly T-cell dependent. Uh, then we wondered about the nature of this response and uh, as we were pursuing uh, the role of different toll-like receptors, uh, sort of as a bonus feature of deleting TLR7, so TLR7 is, uh, uh, among other things, uh, plays a major role in the formation of uh, spontaneous journal centers, and it was shown uh, by, by several labs before. So when we knocked out TLR7 uh, out of DNA 103 knockout mice, we actually uh, uh, got a severe reduc reduction in the journal center formation and in journal center B cells. To our surprise, uh, anti-DNA response uh, was not decreased uh, one bit. So anti-DNA antibodies were still uh, developing. ANA, uh, immune cell activation, there was maybe a tiny reduction of kidney pathology, but, but nothing striking. So it seemed that at least the bulk of the germinal center reaction 
did not seem important for this uh, autoantibody response. So we, we tested the uh, alternative option, which would be the extra follicular uh, B cell response driven by short term uh, plasma blasts. And that indeed seemed to be the case. So if you just look into uh, knockout spleen um, stain for plasma blast and plasma cell marker CD138, you can see this uh, prominent expansion of uh, extra follicular plasma blasts highly significant. Uh, these extra follicular responses driven by a dedicated uh, T-cell uh, uh, subset, uh, first described by, by, by um, the lab of Joe Kraft at Yale. And indeed this uh, extra follicular uh, TFH subset was very significantly uh, increased in DNA's 103 knockout mice. It was completely gone in the absence of CD4 ligand, suggesting some sort of a feedback. So it looked like the main uh, pathway of anti-DNA reactivity in these mice is um, formation of uh, short-term uh, uh, sort of proliferative plasma blasts in the extra follicular region. And this actually is very consistent with the data emerging from human uh, uh, patients with lupus uh, from the work of uh, Inyaki Sanz and Virginia Pasquale and others, they also describe this extra follicular response as important in human lupus. And so then we asked what are the important pathways uh, involved in this response. And, and one of the key pathways that came to mind is type 1 interferon. It's known to be involved in, uh, uh, in lupus. More than half of the patients have the so-called uh, interferon signature. So, and it was known that uh, interferon uh, is required for sort of end-stage inflammation in lupus. But to our surprise, we found that interferon signaling, when we knocked out uh, type 1 interferon receptor, IFNAR, even the initial autoreactivity was reduced, uh, in, uh, both anti-nucleosomal and anti-double-stranded DNA response was significantly reduced. And in particular, this uh, the expansion of extra follicular TFH cells, again, was very significantly rescued in the absence of type 1 interferon. Perhaps um, less surprisingly, all uh, end-stage manifestations were abolished, including antinuclear antibodies, uh, deposition of immune complexes in the kidneys, and so on. So uh, type 1 interferon was, seemed really important to drive these extra follicular B-cell responses, so we wondered about the source of this interferon. And of course, uh, uh, our first guess was plasma cytodendritic cells, the professional uh, interferon producers. And uh, we uh, uh, previously developed a genetic trick to, to test the, the role of PDCs uh, by using um, mice uh, haplodeficient for TCF4, the master regulator of PDC uh, um, development, and indeed we found that uh, the impairment of PDC function essentially phenocopied the deletion of type 1 interferon. There was an early and quite significant reduction of anti-DNA response. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, this expansion of extra follicular plasma blast was abrogated, and all the end-stage manifestations, including antinuclear antibodies, uh, 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 nephritis, uh, deposition of immune complexes, all of this was um, abolished uh, uh, by, by impairing PDC function. We could also directly show that PDCs are strategically located in the extra follicular regions and, and seem to kind of hang out together with this extra follicular plasma blast. So, so uh, it's likely that they might provide some direct help uh, through uh, production of type 1 interferon. And we have some data uh, to support that from in vitro cultures, which I don't have time to, uh, to go into. And just one last uh, uh, vignette about it. So if PDCs are important, we know that TLRs are important. So which TLRs do it? Uh, and of course, our first uh, no-brainer guess was toll-like receptor 9, the canonical receptor for, uh, uh, for unmethylated CPG DNA. Uh, but to our surprise, when we knocked out TLR9, and we actually did this experiment twice just to be sure, with different TLR9 knockouts, 
but the deletion of TLR9 did absolutely nothing to anti-DNA reactivity. So out of desperation, uh, Chetna Sony, a postdoc in the lab, uh, on top of TLR9 uh, knocked out TLR7, which technically is not supposed to do much because it's a nominal receptor for RNA. But uh, quite to our surprise, the double deletion of TLR7 and TLR9 completely ameliorated uh, anti-DNA reactivity uh, and all signs of autoimmunity. So we still need to fully understand why that is and, and how mechanistically TLR7 is involved uh, in the process. But we think it's quite an important uh, observation that, that among other things reconciles a lot of uh, controversy about the role of TLR9, whether it's pathogenic or, or protective. We believe it is pathogenic, but, but it, its function may be partially redundant with TLR7. And so once you remove TLR7, then you really see the contribution of TLR9. Uh, so to, to conclude this part, uh, this reductionist anti-DNA response turns out to be much more complex than one would imagine. So we think that uh, at least the key steps involve, of course, the accumulation of this more immunogenic cell-free DNA, potentially including longer polynucleosomal DNA fragments and, and, and DNA exposed on microparticles. So, so uh, these probably engage potentially autoreactive B cells through their uh, uh, B-cell receptor, but also through uh, endosomal toll-like receptors, including both TLR7 and 9. Uh, and this uh, fuels the formation of uh, short-lived uh, uh, plasma blasts that differentiate extrafollicularly, receive help from these extrafollicular uh, TFH cells. And this uh, process is active and ongoing and, and fueled by constant supply of cell antigen uh, leads to the production of autoantibodies and an important kind of uh, 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 part of this process is the activation of PDCs again uh, apparently through TLR7 and 9 which leads to the production of type 1 interferon and other cytokines which seem to provide important direct help to, to, to this extrafollicular response and fuel the generation of uh, autoreactive plasma blasts. And then, of course, eventually uh, uh, the germinal re uh, center reaction kicks in. Uh, Long lived plasma cells be become uh, 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 formed, uh, leads to the formation of uh, high affinity uh, antibodies, formation of immune complexes, and uh, the, the, the eventual uh, lupus like disease. So this again is a work, uh, our uh, working model that it, uh, has a lot to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to discover further, but that's what, where we are at the moment. So it's a pleasure to thank people who have contributed to, to the work. Uh, in, in the lab, it was all started by a, a brilliant former postdoc, Vina Sisirak, who is now a um, faculty uh, in, in, in the University of Bordeaux in France. Uh, the human work was spearheaded largely by Hannes Hartl, a former uh, clinical fellow and a graduate student, Lee Serpas, with help from uh, Dylan Wang. And most of the mouse work was, was done by Chet Sony and Oriana Perez also helped a lot, as well as some former lab members. And we had great collaborations along the way, most importantly with, with Jill Bouillon and her group of rheumatologists at NYU. Uh, with Dennis Law at the University of Hong Kong and, and many others. And uh, just wanted to mention that NYU opened the Translational Immunology Center and we are searching for talented junior immunologists. So please, uh, please apply. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Boris. That was excellent. Thanks for sharing your excellent and thorough work and for giving this wonderful example on how very fundamental basic biology can really tell us a lot about what might be going on in such a serious disease and complex disease like lupus. So thank you so much. Thank now, you, Boris, that, that was a great, great talk and very intriguing the findings. Yeah, I have my questions, but I will go directly to Twitter as Carla will indicate now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see. I need to share my screen, but why am I seeing something? Maybe 
I, I, I'm, there we go. Maybe if we see. Let's see. Um, let's see. Um, one second. Ah, let's see. Let's see now. Hmm. Hold on one second. I apologize for this. Let me see if I can share now. now Carla, Am I sharing? Yes, you're sharing. Okay. Sorry about that. But just to remind everybody that you can ask your questions to Boris via Twitter. Uh, so you will be able to find this tweet that says ask questions for Dr. Boris Races here. Uh, please remember the hashtag Global Immuno and Boris will be using the Immuno Speaker account today to answer the questions. So thank you again, Boris. That was wonderful. And I'm sure there will be now many questions on Twitter. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Boris. See everyone next week. Bye. Bye.